Good morning, good morning. Good morning, Donalyn. Hello. We, hi, Carlos. We are currently closing the waiting room and letting people get in while everyone I see kind of connecting to audio. Um, we are going to get started in just a moment. I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Jocelyn, but just a reminder of who we are. Um, I'm Donalyn. I'm here with my colleagues, Jocelyn and Malachi. And if you need anything, we are at your service. So you can email us or drop us a note in chat if you need anything throughout the day. And we will do our best to answer questions or get you where you need to be. Um, we will move into some different breakouts again today. So just a note, if you ever get lost um, in KaiStorm, you know, it can be overwhelming in the beginning. You can always come back to this room and one person from KI will always be here to help navigate you to where we are in the agenda, just in case you did lose track of time or kind of get lost in the agenda. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jocelyn, so that she can orient you to the day. Thank you. Uh, how's my screen, Donalyn? Are we good? Awesome. Uh, so as Donalyn said, thank you so much. Uh, we'd like to welcome you back. Um, we started the day wonderfully. Uh, we had some great lightning talks this morning um, by Dong Feng, Carmela, and Jan and uh, raving reviews. So we just wanna give them a shout out. Uh, those were wonderful. And there was some very rich conversation that happened right after. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about what's going to happen today. So uh, we'll have David Stone uh, give us a couple of words or say a few words to start us and kick us off for the day. Right after that, we'll get into our project presentations. Um, we'll kick it off with the first one, a kinetic model of the mechanics of pollen hydration. And just wanted to give you all a little bit of a reminder of how that's going to happen. So if you go on to KaiStorm, if we could just you know play back our memory from yesterday, we had the opportunity to actually ask our keynotes and presenters questions um, so we'll be doing the same today. So if you go to the project presentation page and you scroll below, you will see that there is a note um, saying that you can post your questions on here. And as Donalyn is showing us on the shared screen, the way to do that is that you uh, press the plus sign that was on the right hand side. Once you write your note, you hit the paper airplane on the bottom right and you can begin to post your questions. So we really encourage you that you post these as you hear the presentations throughout the day. We will have a uh, time after to address these um, within the presentation. So thank you so much, Donalyn. Um, after that, what we'll be doing is that we will be going through um, lunch break and just a quick reminder with lunch break, uh, we ask you to uh, sign up for your concurrent sessions and we'll get into that um, in a bit. We'll go through our social activity. Um, what, you will have an opportunity to meet some new collaborators. Uh, and just a friendly reminder with those collaborations, it'd be great uh, to make sure that you connect so that you can apply for the training and travel awards that David uh, talked a bit about yesterday. We'll get into our second project presentation We'll come back for a soft close, and then we will head over to our concurrent sessions, okay? So a little bit more about our concurrent sessions. Um, just a reminder that it is on a first come first serve basis. Uh, the meet a modeler, a lot of our sessions are already filled. We have about four uh, slots that are remaining. Um, so please be sure to do that. And again, we request if you do sign up for these slots to please show up and be on time. Uh, we also have our concurrent workshops, the introduction to computational approaches for cell biologists, and then also how to talk to biologists, tips for computational scientists. Um, the other thing that we have uh, throughout our events is that we have our social activities. And so yesterday we did a bit of speed networking and we posted a couple of questions on KaiStorm. Uh, today we will be doing something called birds of a feather. So that's an opportunity for us to really 
um, group like discipline. So we'll have uh, biologists together, computational scientists, um, and also provide you with prompts to really to explore discussions and conversations a bit further. Again, it's also an opportunity to meet uh, potential collaborators. On Wednesday, we'll do some speed networking. On Thursday, we won't have any speed uh, networking or social tech activities within the time, but just remember that we have the Wonder Room after. And then we also have um, trio uh, conversations on Friday. So um, before we get into um, passing it on to Dave, Donalyn, is there anything that I'm missing or Malachi? No, I think that's great. Thanks, Jocelyn. Wonderful. All right, so I'd like to kick it off to Dave to uh, give a soft welcome. Good morning, everyone. I wanna um, mention a few highlights from yesterday. I was thinking about it on the way to work today. Uh, Wallace Marshall's talk, of course, was a highlight, but what really struck me in retrospect is how many models he talked about. The flagellar length problem is something he's actually been thinking about and working on since he was a postdoc. And in all these many years, he's gone um, through many models, I think he, he must, must have mentioned at least six or eight different models during his talk. And what I was struck by was he started off with the quest for simplicity. And in the end, I think he's come around to the fact that um, the system is just not as simple as he'd like it to be. And it reminded me, I'm going to remember to share my screen this time. Um, it reminded me of the, these quotes. I've shown them at this meeting before. There's um, the one all biologists know, Occam's razor, the less complex the explanation, the better. And the famous quote from Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I bring this up because I think this is a constant tension um, as we try to understand nature at the cell level, the tension between our quest for simplicity and evolution's confounding determination to make things extraordinarily complex. So let me now unshare my screen. Don't want you guys reading my email. And uh, the second thing I wanted to note was the poster session, which I really enjoyed that poster session more than any I've been to ever. So I'm a big believer now in virtual poster sessions. You could really discuss with a group of people, the poster and the presenter, just very much more sane. I did spill some warm beer on one leg just to give it a little more reality, like a real session. But otherwise, um, it, it was great. I really um, would suggest that we always do poster sessions virtually. Um, okay, so that's it for the recap on yesterday. I, I want to just come back to this point of the meet a modeler sign up. So my um, KI colleagues are, are pleased with the sign up because we have uh, 11 out of 15 slots filled. I am not pleased. And I don't know if any of anybody out there is really the people I want to address. But um, if you're not, then you can just mute me for a while and read your email. But what I want to say is there, there's no reason these slots shouldn't be filled. I, I'm going to chastise the attendees for not filling these slots quickly with a waiting list. This is a very, very good opportunity. It doesn't come along very often. In the past, we've overfilled these sessions. So I was trying to figure out why it is that they're not filled. And I, I thought first, well, we have a lot of graduate students and postdocs. And they may be thinking, well, I don't have a lab. I, I can't go and talk to one of these experts. But that's not true. You can. If you're a graduate student, you have a project. You can go and talk to one of our experts. You don't need a lab. Secondly, I thought maybe they're a little intimidated, the attendees, because unlike in previous years, they haven't met these people in, pe in person. Normally, we would be mixing at coffee breaks, et cetera. Let me just assure you, these people are all nice people. They're personally vetted by me. So, um, you know, you don't have to be afraid. They're, they're here to help you. And by the way, what are they being paid? That's a rhetorical question, nothing. They're not being paid anything. They're here to help you guys. So you might think, well, what do I have to say? I don't have any equations. You don't need equations. All you need 
is a project that you're working on and you can meet a modeler and you can say, here's what I'm doing. Do you think I'm at a point where I can begin to think about modeling this? And if so, how? That's it, that's your starting conversation. And believe me, the 30 minutes that you have will go very quickly. Okay, so that's it for the chastising of the attendees. If um, people don't fill these four slots, I will. I'll take the four slots. All right. So what are we, how are we doing on time, Donna Lynn? We are good. Okay. You're doing great. There's a question really quick though, yeah, um, yeah. Dave, about just a reminder on how to sign up. So do you mind if I just take one second to share my screen and remind people? Please. Okay, excellent. Um, so if you are on the agenda, so let's actually just start on the agenda on Tuesday, you can go down to the concurrent sessions and you can see the three different concurrent sessions that are going on. The one that Dave is talking about is this meet a modeler and you will notice that there are only a few slots left. So you would just kind of click here to sign up where, um, where you are able to. So that is it. I hope that helps. Back to you, Dave. Okay, so I think that that's a wrap for the um, introduction to today, recap of yesterday, and I'm just gonna move on to the first um, project presentation. And before we get to that, I wanna explain what the project presentations are, because I think they're, this is a format that's unique to the FYIM meetings. So the project presentation always involves at least two researchers, usually PIs, but they can be graduate students and postdocs as well. And it always involves an interdisciplinary collaboration, um, which is exploring a biological problem using computational modeling. And the way we set up the presentation is, well, first of all, the presenters have to be published presenting unpublished work. And a lot of big meetings you go to the, uh, the big talks are either published or they're about to be published. It's like, here's the brilliant stuff we've done, admire it. But this is a different spirit. This is in process work that hasn't been published. Usually it's people who have never published a model together, although we do have one exception where one of the project presentations involves two PIs who have published together, but all the other five, they've never published together um, modeling. So you have a biologist, and that person will spend about 20 minutes explaining the biological aspect of the project. And then a computational person who will spend about 20 minutes explaining the computational aspect of the project. And then we're reserving 20 minutes for our three person expert panel to interact with the presenters, comment, critique, offer advice and feedback. Um, in the past, in e earlier years, it was only one of our six experts, but this time we decided to go with three. So where there are three experts to interact with um, the two presenters at each project presentation. Now, the audience at large is certainly welcome to post questions. There will be a moderator for each project presentation. I'll be doing the first one. That person will be looking at the questions coming in you can direct questions at anyone, the biologist, the computational collaborator, or any of the three experts. So please don't hesitate to send your questions. This is a group discussion. Uh, I think that's it for explaining the format. And um, are there any questions about that? Okay, so in that case, I think we can go on to the first project presentation, which I don't have up. Just a sec. I would be happy to introduce if you like, Dave. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the the title in front of me. Sure. Unfortunately. No problem. Um, but I uh, I do want to say that the I'll just say the presenters. Um, my good friend, Liz, it's going to be fine, Haswell, and um, Carrie Miller doing the computational part. And the title of their talk is 
a um, kinetic model of the mechanics of pollen hydration. Okay, let me get my slides going here. They look great, Liz. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about this project. And um, we are so, so, so looking forward to um, getting feedback from everybody. So the way that we've organized this is for me to give a brief introduction to sort of the biology of the system, the, the questions that we're interested in asking, and then Carrie Miller, who's a graduate student in my laboratory, is going to take over and talk about all of the modeling that we've been doing in collaboration with them with a modeler at WashU. But this is all sort of in flux, so we're more than excited to hear people's thoughts. Okay, so my lab is interested in broadly how plants and plant cells sense and respond to mechanical stimuli. This is not a new question. Darwin and his son asked this question many years ago. Um, this is just on the left is an illustration of a cool experiment they did where they just put a piece of paper on the side of a root um, from a germinating seed and saw that the root sort of grew away from that touch stimulus. Now, of course, we know a lot more about all of the many mechanical stimuli, both internal and external, that plants and animals and bacteria respond to. And we know a lot about the ways in which they respond. They can change their growth or their shape, the way that they um, interact with the, the rest of the world, such as increased resistance to pests and so on. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this growing field of uh, mechanobiology. Um, what we don't know very much about is um, how this all happens sort of more at the molecular and physical level. So some of the big questions in my field are, how does a cell, a tissue, or an organ sense force? How is that force then translated into a signal the plant cell can read? And how does the plant then respond appropriately to the combination of all the signals that are coming in? Um, and how does it integrate that with other stimuli that it's getting, such as light and water and so on? Um, but one of the big questions, and this is sort of the, the question that our, our topic today addresses, is how do the material properties of the plant cell and the plant cell components contribute to all of these mechanoperceptive steps? So I just wanted to introduce you a little bit to the idea of plant cell mechanics, especially for those of you who aren't plant biologists. Some of this might come as a little bit of a surprise. So plant cells like bacteria are surrounded by a cell wall. In plants, they're made out of primarily a, um, a sugar-based system called cellulose, and this both surrounds the protoplast or, you know, the bag of cellular components, and it cements the cells together. Um, inside the large vacuole, which um, you can see here is a, sort of a blue blob. This is a huge organelle that has a lot of purposes, but for our purposes here, it stores water and helps drive what's called turgor pressure. Now, turgor pressure is the force that the protoplast applies on the cell wall, and it can be anywhere from 1 to 10 atmospheres. So we're talking about the amount of pressure that's in your car tire. The elastic modulus of the cell wall, that is the ability of the cell wall to resist this turgor pressure, is also quite variable depending on what cell type you're looking at, and it also can be extremely hard to measure. This is something that our field is grappling with right now, but it can be anywhere from uh, 10 megapascals to 10 gigapascals. Very, very, very strong. Now, in between the cell wall and the protoplast is, of course, the plasma membrane. Um, there are lots of putative or known mechanosensors present in that plasma membrane, but our own personal favorite are a class of proteins called mechanosensitive ion channels. Um, and this is primarily what my laboratory studies. So mechanosensitive ion channels provide a really beautiful and um, efficient molecular mechanism for sensing and responding to force applied to a membrane. So as I've just described, physical events from both outside and inside the cell are capable of changing the physical properties of the plasma membrane, fluidity or tension. Um, according to uh, the force from lipids principle, 
tension, that is lateral tension applied to the lipid bilayer can actually be redirected to change the geometry of membrane embedded proteins, such as these ion channels. And I'm gonna show you on the right, you can see a cryo-EM structure. I'm gonna show you exactly how that works in a second. So mechanosensitive ion channels are protein pores in the membrane. They allow ions or osmolites to cross the membrane down their electrochemical gradient. And they do so in response to increased lateral membrane tension. And we know that they, uh, so yeah, so I like to think of mechanosensitive ion channels as sort of translators, where they translate the language of physics in the form of tension into the language of biology in the form of ion transport. So um, just to give you a visual on how these channels function, um, we recently collaborated with um, Yuan Peng Yuan's lab at the University of Washington, um, sorry, Washington University, I can't believe I did that, Washington University Medical School and uh, to solve the open and closed state structure of a mechanosensitive channel from Arabidopsis. And you can see from this video how it works. So up here in green, those are the, that's the transmembrane domain. And you can see it going from a closed state where the helices are mostly straight up to an open state where they now are all linear. And if you uh, now look down on the channel, like through the pore, you can see how these helices lie on their sides during tension. And you can see how the channel opens as that happens right there. Okay, so I could talk for a thousand years about mechanosensitive ion channels and how great they are, but really I wanna talk about, ooh, I'm having trouble. Oh, there we go, um, about the uh, plant cell as a whole. So the idea here uh, that we're sort of thinking about in the laboratory, a very basic idea about how the plant cell stays the size that it wants to be or grows to the size that it wants to be is by a balance between osmotic pressure and the cell wall. So in a homeostatic situation, the strength of the cell wall and the strength of the osmotic pressure are in balance and mechanosensitive ion channels are, I should say, closed. Um, now, if the cell wall is damaged or it's weakened or osmotic pressure increases, now the cell will be out of balance and uh, the mechanosensitive ion channels will open because that, that plasma membrane in between osmotic pressure and the cell wall will increase in tension. So the cool part is that if these ion channels release ions, they reduce the osmotic pressure. Now the whole system can then return to a homeostatic state. So um, the, um, the whole question here is, uh, this is really nice, it's very simple, it's very Wallace Marshall-y, uh, but how can we study this and sort of get a sense of whether this simple idea is really how things are working and is this really what mechanosensitive channels are doing? So to answer that, we've been studying um, using as a model system, the Arabidopsis pollen grain. So pollen is incredibly, incredibly cool. And I, again, could talk for another thousand years on how cool pollen is, but just briefly, it carries the male gametes, so it's criti critical for the propagation of all flowering plants. Um, it's easily isolated from other cells without disrupting the cell wall. This is a super important point um, because most other cells in multicellular plants, it's very hard to study the mechanics of them without having to add in the contribution of their neighbors. Uh, there's lots of assays for studying them in vitro and in vivo, lots of genetic and imaging tools. So it's a simple but a complicated system. So just like I did, I wrote this before David uh, gave the introduction, but really this tension between being simple and complex is all really embodied in the pollen grain. Um, and uh, the very, very coolest part and the part that got us interested is that pollen also undergoes repeated osmotic and or mechanical challenges during development and fertilization. So that's illustrated here. So up here on the top, this is what an Arabidopsis flower looks like. It has both male and female gametes are produced through meiosis in this structure. And then they also meet to fuse and form the um, zygote and the next generation, which of course implants are seeds. So if you look over here at the anther, which is colored yellow in, um, in the flower, uh, the anther is where the pollen grains develop and form. And those are the, the cells that I'm telling you about that contain the male gametes. Um, 
on the right in green in well, actually in the middle of the flower and then illustrated on the right is the carpal and this contains the ovules which are uh, have the egg cells in them, which are the female gametes. Now, during the process of fertilization, the anther, uh, the pollen grains in the anther first undergo desiccation, so they lose most of their water. And not in a different plant, different plants do this differently, but in Arabidopsis, they undergo quite a bit of desiccation. Um, they lose most of their metabolic activity, and they actually they also undergo dehiscence, which is to say they detach completely from the anther, and then they are can fly around. That's what causes you to be inhaling uh, pollen grains when you're um, having allergies. Uh, the pollen grain then attaches to the um, these really sticky cells on the top of the carpal. Here's the key part. So this step right here, where it undergoes hydration. Water is absorbed or liquid is absorbed from the female, uh, these female cells, uh, and the pollen grain is rehydrated, it's reanimated, metabolism starts again, it germinates a tube, the single cell tube goes all the way down into the carpal, finds an egg cell, and they fuse and create the next generation of plants. So it's the whole thing is amazing. You're, if you don't know about this, you should be super excited about it. But we're just going to focus in on this awesome pollen grain because it has all the components we need to really ask interesting questions about plant cell mechanics. Now, just to be perfectly clear, and for the bi plant biologists out there, I know this is not a single cell. It's actually a single cell with two other cells inside of it. So the two sperm cells that actually are the male gametes are inside of the pollen grain. But we're just going to pretend that they don't exist for the from, from now on. Um, it's all driven by the vegetative nucleus. There is a really fancy and interesting cell wall on the outside of it. And most interesting for us, there's also a mechanosensitive ion channel that you can find in uh, the plasma membrane of the pollen grain. So uh, that is called MSL8. And we've shown, spent quite some time showing that MSL8 is a bona fide mechanosensitive ion channel. Um, we use uh, a lot of uh, single channel patch clamp electrophysiology to show this. We express our channels in Xenopus oocytes. Um, we've made a bunch of point mutations in the pore lining domain of MSL8 to test and see whether they affect channel activity. And this is just uh, an example of the types of experiments that we do. So these are um, electrophysiological traces where the X axis here is time and the Y axis is current. So if we're expressing a wild type MSL8 channel, you can see these little stepwise increases in current as we apply suction to the patch in the patch pipette. Each of these little steps is one channel opening in that patch, and then you can see those channels closing. Now we can introduce point mutations, as I said, into the pore that change the way in which the channel functions. And um, so for example, we can make this, uh, this change here F720L, that pretty much decimates the channel activity. Um, it, it, however, it does not change the channel expression or localization. So we have the protein there, but it's the, the pore essentially seems to be blocked. So it's a very useful tool for us. Okay, so just to get into a little bit of the biology, um, and to really focus in on this hydration step. We're interested in germination and in tube growth, but for the purposes of the modeling that, we've, that we're gonna present to you today, really have been focusing on this step where the pollen grain goes from, from desiccated to finding the stigma cell and getting hydrated and reanimated. <clears throat> so one thing that we discovered is that if you knock out the, this mechanosensitive ion channel, MSL8, in pollen grains, or if you just introduce one of these pore blocking mutations, now you can't, that those pollen grains can no longer survive hydration in water. So this experiment is very simple. You take pollen grains, you off of the plant that are fully uh, desiccated and you put them in water. And then you look at them on the microscope to see whether they're dead or alive. We use this dual staining approach. And wild type pollen grains are just fine and MSL8 mutant or pore blocked lines are not. They're mostly dead. We found we did many, many controls, but we one thing to know is that we found that um, we can actually prevent that death if we just hydrate them instead of in water. We hydrate them in a more slowly in a solution that contains PEG, suggesting that 
uh, what we're looking at is actually an osmotic response or a, an inability to respond to the osmotic shock of water. Um, and then the last piece of biology that I want to share with you is the fact that overexpressing MSL8. So instead of knocking it out, like I just showed you, now overexpressing it actually keeps pollen grains from germinating. So in this top panel here, we're, all we're doing is counting how many pollen, pollen grains are capable of producing one of those functional tubes. And LER is the wild type. And these are three different lines that are expressing MSL8 at in, at, 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 high, at higher levels. And you can see that they really don't germinate well, and that the, the ability of them to germinate is inversely proportional to the expression level, at least at the transcript level. So all of this taken together has led us to what we call the Goldilocks model, this idea that you have to have some MSL8, but you can't have too much in order to for the pollen grain to go through and survive properly all of these osmotic shocks. So the idea is, is illustrated here. In a wild type pollen grain, it's desiccated. When it gets rehydrated on the female stigma cells, MSL8 uh, uh, mechanosensitive channels are required to release a little bit of the, of the um, turgor pressure uh, during that step, but not too much so that then germination and tube growth can occur and the pollen is optimally fertile. If you knock MSL8 out or you make use one of these pore blocked lines, now what we see is that during rehydration or what we propose is that during rehydration, they no longer survive because they're actually popping. However, they do germinate, they actually germinate better um, at, at a faster rate, but they uh, tend to pop later. So they're compromised at both the hydration and the tube stages. And then we see the opposite when we look at overexpressed MSL8. Here, the idea is that there are so many channels in the pollen grain that they're, um, while they are able to survive rehydration, they uh, can never germinate because they can't ever build up enough turgor to actually drive the process of, of, of germination and tube growth. So this is hypothetical and something we've been trying to understand for a long time. And essentially the idea here is that MSL8 is serving as an osmotic safety valve. It's just letting out a little bit of turgor and uh, maintaining cellular integrity during all of these processes, but just not too much, just the right amount. And here is a video that Carrie made that sort of illustrates our idea. So these are pollen grains that you are watching. Uh, hydration happen um, in real time. And this should give you a sense of exactly how much water they're taking up and how quickly. So this, this is, I think, in real time. So water is added and you can see the pollen grains swelling up quickly. But if you look at the pollen grain with the red arrow, you might, you'll notice in a minute that it begins to lose integrity. And this is, you can see the cellular contents releasing. And so this is something that we see fairly often in MSL8 mutant pollen, but we really don't see that often in wild type pollen. So we think it's an osmotic safety valve, but we don't know. And what we really wanted just a couple years ago, we, and actually, inspired by, actually inspired by Wallace and by this group, we decided we really wanted to better understand the physics of the process and to really gut check our ideas, um, not gut check, but like mathematically check our gut on what was going on with uh, the role of mechanosensitive channels in this whole process. So um, originally I banded together with Wanda and Masood, um, at one of Wallace's workshops, and we got started on an, an initial equation just to describe what happens to a desiccated pollen grain when water is added. Since then, Carrie Miller, who's a graduate student in my lab, took this up as her thesis project, and we have worked very closely with Anders Carlson, who really should be the person here talking about the modeling, but um, really wasn't available today. Our early work was funded by the NSF um, STC, the Center for Engineering Mechanobiology, and now we have um, uh, funding specifically for this project from NSF. So that's the setup. 
And I think I will now hand things over to Carrie and she can tell you more about the modeling and how we went back and forth between modeling and experimental data. Okay. Um, I think you have to stop sharing first. Oh, sorry, that's my yeah. fault. <laughs> no worries. Yep. She, I take all my direction from Carrie. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, so like she said, I'm a graduate student here in the Haswell lab. Um, I'm going to be talking about the, the modeling part of our pollen um, hydration project. Um, so before I get into it, I just want to again give a big shout out to Anders. Um, he definitely should be uh, the one describing this, so I hope I do it justice um, for him. Um, he had a very heavy hand in developing this model. Um, so like she said, the, the main purpose of, of developing a model like this was really to test the function of uh, MS channels during pollen hydration and whether or not our assumptions are really what's going on in the, the actual system. Um, so I just want to kind of give you a, a basic idea of what our initial model looked like. Um, so this basic model incorporates cell mechanics, osmotic conditions, and of course, the presence of mechanosense of ion channels. Uh, and I do just kind of want to give you uh, a warning that we had some simplifying assumptions. So um, like we just saw, the Rabidopsis pollen grain is kind of a kind of an ellipsoid shape, um, but we're actually modeling it as uh, spherical, um, just to keep the, the calculations simple. Um, the idea, idea there being that we could just use a relative volume change to compare it to um, experimental data. Um, furthermore, um, the membrane and the cell wall actually have separate stiffness values, um, but we just modeled the outside of the grain as a single unit and effectively ignored the membrane stiffness because it is so much smaller. Um, such a smaller value than the cell wall stiffness, which we'll see uh, in a second. Um, and most of the parameter values that we obtained were, were already existing uh, in the literature. And so I just kind of give you an idea of what those parameter values look like. Um, they can kind of be separated into two different categories, um, the physical property of the cell, um, and then also properties of the MSL8 channel. Um, so I won't spend too much time here, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what the values look like and what we were kind of um, thinking and, and, and using our model here. Um, so we have like the size of the cell, the cell radius, um, the cell wall stiffness and the membrane stiffness. And here you can see how much larger the cell wall stiffness is compared to the membrane. Um, we also have things like the osmotic concentration and water permeability. These are two values that later we had to, to fit to the data. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then as far as properties of the MSL8 channel goes, um, we have a channel opening stress. So this is the membrane tension at which the, the channel will open. Um, and then we also have the, the ion leakage rate out of MSLA, so how quickly it's changing the osmotic concentration. And then, of course, we have some constants and thermodynamic values. Um, so I just want to give you a brief walkthrough of, of our very simple and initial model. Um, so this is basically what we do at each time step uh, in the model. Um, so the first thing we do is we calculate the membrane, membrane tension. So this is the, the sigma value. Um, so we have the sigma and is equal to the membrane stiffness, and then that's multiplied by essentially the strain. So this is the radius over the initial radius minus one. And once we know the membrane tension, now we can determine whether or not our MSL8 channels are open in the model. So if sigma is larger than the opening tension, the sigma C, then we know that the osmotic concentration is being changed by MSL8 channels. So that's this K leak value, the osmotic leakage rate. Uh, we just multiply that um, negative um, by C0, the in initial osmolite, osmolite concentration. Um, once we know whether or not the um, osmotic concentration is changing, now we can define the osmotic concentration itself. Um, so that's just the C value um, taken in proportion of the, the cell size. And then uh, finally, we'll determine the change in the radius. Um, so this is a, a rate. Uh, equation. So this is dr over dt, change in radius over time. Um, and this is equal to the water permeability. Um, and you can see our constants in there, and then also the cell wall stiffness. Um, like I said, we effectively ignore the membrane stiffness. Um, so we developed this model. I'm able to run it over uh, a, a set amount of time. Um, and so I ran this for both a wild type version, so a hash channel function, and then also uh, an MSO8 mutant version. Um, so without MS channels, um, with no MS channel function. Um, and so when we do that, this is the result that we get. Um, so this is the relative volume change over time um, in seconds. And so the black line is our wild type with MS channels and the pink is our MSL8 simulation. So there's no channel function. 
Um, and we actually see uh, it, they look about the same until you get to this inflection point. And then there's an overshoot uh, in the volume of the wild type simulation while the MSL8 simulation uh, stabilizes. And this was not entirely unexpected. In fact, it was pretty expected um, because other models um, of hypoosmotic shock have shown something really similar. So this 2015 uh, study was looking at E. coli hypoosmotic shock. Um, and so this is their experimental result, but they also developed a model. And the time scale is different. This is in minutes, but you can see very early on right here, there's an overshoot in the volume and then it drops back down before recovering. Um, so this, this overshoot due to MS channel function, uh, in this case, it's MISC-S and MISC-L, um, is, is pretty common. Um, so we really weren't too surprised that this is what's happening, because essentially what we're modeling is that the osmolites are leaving the cell, and then the water is following, and it's shrinking the, the cell back down. Um, so not too unexpected, um, but now let's see if that's really what's happening in, in the pollen grain system itself. And so to do that, um, I established a method of quantifying uh, in vitro pollen hydration. So this is a Rhabdopsis pollen, and we've kind of already seen this uh, earlier, but I'm just hydrating it in water here. It happens pretty quickly. This is sped up a little bit. Within about 25, 30 seconds, uh, they're completely hydrated. Um, so I did this again and again, and I would measure the length and the width of each pollen grain uh, and estimate a relative volume change uh, over time. And so by doing this, we can use the output um, to compare it directly to the, the, the simulations. Um, so what did we see when we do this? Well, like all good science, um, it was not what we were expecting. So this is, again, the relative volume change uh, over time. Um, but here you can see the wild type actually stabilizes while the MSL8 continues to slowly expand, which is almost exactly the opposite of what uh, our simulation predicted, uh, which is an overshoot in the wild type and a stabilization in, in the MSL8. And if you look a little further in the background of the model, on every time point, we're actually calculating the membrane tension, um, which is not something we can get experimentally, but just for a you know, reality check, we looked at the membrane tension, which is graphed on the right y-axis here. Um, and this line here marks with the skull the lytic membrane tension. So this is the tension at which the cell, the membrane of the cell will likely burst. Um, and so you can see that our membrane tensions are way too high. They're about four times higher than they should be. Um, and we know that the wild type can survive this process. Um, so this is definitely something that's probably not very realistic. Um, furthermore, we're seeing this overshoot and a stabilization in, in, in MSL8. Um, so at this point, we, we realize we probably need to readdress some of our assumptions. Uh, the model starts to get a little spicier from here. And we're kind of going, going back and forth to figure out what assumptions uh, we should be uh, addressing and, and thinking about here. Um, so the first question that we asked ourselves is, how is the pollen grain system different from these previous models of hypoosmotic shock, um, like E. coli? So how is pollen different from E. coli besides the obvious? Um, so pollen grains are, are very dry, um, often less than 30% water. Like Liz talked about, they usually, at least in a Arabidopsis, will desiccate down uh, before they're released uh, into the environment. So one possibility that we're thinking is that Maybe when the, the pollen grain dries down, the membrane is no longer stretched tight because the, the protoplast is no longer filled uh, with water. And so instead, the membrane has folds that actually have to unfold before uh, membrane tension can start to build. Um, and so we kind of thought about incorporating this, this membrane unfolding idea, and possibly that could, could explain some of the um, discrepancies we're having between the model and the experimental. And so we sought to incorporate that into our model. Um, and so to do this, pretty simple. Um, the first thing we did was calculate a strain, which is just a mechanical word for basically a size change. Um, so that's epsilon here. Um, it's just R over R0, radius over initial radius uh, minus one. And then we set a strain threshold. So this is epsilon minimum. And once the epsilon gets above the epsilon minimum threshold, um, then we can assume that all the membrane stores have unfolded. And we can start to calculate the membrane tension, which is related to the, the membrane stiffness. So once we incorporate this into the model, what do we see? Um, well, up here you can see the faded lines is the actual experimental data, and then the darker lines uh, are the simulation, and we have membrane tension down here. Um, first thing you'll notice is that the wild type simulation no longer shows that sharp overshoot. It starts to stabilize with a little bit of an overshoot, um, but it starts to look more like what we see in the experimental. Um, Furthermore, the, the, the membrane and both the membrane tension in both the MSL8 mutant and the wild type 
are now below the lytic threshold, which is much more realistic um, and, and much more reasonable. Um, the, I bet you'll notice though that one glaring issue is the MSL8 simulation is still not doing you know, what we expected where it continues to expand the characteristic phenotype um, of MSLA being hydrated. Um, so still need to readdress something here. One of our assumptions um, still not quite right. So why does the MSLA simulation not continue to expand like we see in the experimental data? Um, essentially what's going on is there's an equilibrium between the cell wall resistance uh, and the turgor pressure, which is resulting in this, this size stabilization that we're seeing. And so we went back and kind of thought a little bit more about the properties of the cell wall and cell walls, plant cell walls are pretty unique. Um, and one way in which cell walls are often described is viscoelastoplastic. So this is like mechanics speak where basically the cell wall will behave elastically to a certain extent. So you can kind of follow along with this figure here on the right. Um, they'll behave elastically. So they'll stretch kind of like a rubber band. Um, so they're kind of flexible and, and stretchy in this area. But then once so much strain is added, they start to behave plastically. So this is where they start to slowly deform permanently. Um, and so it's possible that we're actually reaching a strain threshold here, and they're starting to behave um, in, a, in a plastic manner. Um, if it gets too deformed, it does eventually fracture. Um, so we're thinking maybe, maybe we need to incorporate a more complicated cell wall behavior to explain the, the slow expansion that we're seeing that looks so much different than, than the fast um, early expansion that we see. Um, so to do this, the first thing we do is uh, calculate a turgor pressure, uh, which is easy to do. We already have the, the cell wall stiffness and then the size of the, the cell, the strain of the cell. Um, and then we can set a pressure threshold. So that's PC here. And once the pressure gets to be above the pressure threshold, then we can assume that the cell wall will begin to behave plastically uh, and deform. Um, in order to do this, we did have to add another rate constant. So that's this KP value. Um, the units of that are, are inverse seconds. Um, and so by adding this, it alters our um, calculation of the change in the, the radius. So the dr dt um, is now our regular dr dt plus this extra factor, uh, which is the, the rate constant um, and the pressure minus the, the pressure threshold uh, multiplied by the radius. Um, so what do we do? What do we get when we add this into the model? Um, we actually get a very beautiful alignment between the MSL8 simulation and the MSL8 data. Um, we really see that nice, clean, um, slow expansion um, that we see in the experimental when, when this is added into the model. We do still see a bit of an overshoot in the wild type uh, simulation. Uh, and I will point out that in the membrane tension, the MSL8 actually rises slightly above the lytic threshold. Um, but we didn't consider this to be completely unrealistic since like we saw earlier, the MSL8 polymerase tend to explode. Um, so it, we kind of you know, just write that off as, as maybe something that could be, could be happening. Um, so now really the only final, final question here is this volume overshoot that we see in the wild type. Um, and this, you know, could it be related to the channel function? You know, MSL8 is not the same as the MIS gas and the MIS L that we see in, in E. coli. It's similar, but it's not necessarily um, exactly the same. Um, so we thought about maybe modifying some of our assumptions about the channel function to see if uh, we can't get that, that overshoot kind of discrepancy resolved. Um, so we first tried adjusting just the membrane tension at which the MSL8 channel opens. Maybe it's just a problem with the value that we picked. So just a reminder about how, uh, MS, how the MSL8 channel uh, assumptions are working in the model. Um, the channel opens when the, the uh, tension rises above the opening threshold, and then it will close when the tension drops back below that opening threshold again. Um, so if we change this opening threshold, um, so uh, this is the result that we get at varying opening thresholds. So five millinewtons per meter is the one that we normally use. It's this green line here. Um, you can see that it doesn't really make too much of a difference. It just kind of moves it up and down. Um, they get too low and you, you really get an overshoot of this. So that's like constitutively open channel. Um, and too high, it starts to look really weird with a, like a sharp point. Um, so we kind of wrote this off as probably not you know, it's not a simple fix. It's not just a parameter value uh, issue that we're having here. Um, and so that made us think that maybe there are ways that the MSLA channels could be functioning differently than the previous uh, MS channel models. Um, and one thing that's discussed quite a bit among mechanical sensitive ion channel literature is this idea of uh, channel closing or an activation um, that's not super straightforward. Um, it can 
it can have some, some intricacies to it. And there might actually be some channel inactivation that's different from our original assumptions. Uh, so remember that it closes when the memory tension drops below the opening threshold. Um, but we had a couple other ideas that maybe it's actually closing due to, to other things going on. So it could be that it's closing when the membrane tension starts to decrease. So the D sigma over DT becomes less than zero or possibly after a period of time. So like a, like a K close, a, a set threshold of time. And then the, the channel will close despite sustained um, opening tensions. Um, so this is not entirely uh, unfounded. Like I, I mentioned earlier, this is something that we see quite a bit in uh, NS channel um, literature. So using electrophysiology, um, it's really kind of been observed that MS channels can inactivate even when the, the membrane tension is elevated. This is from a review paper just showing that the membrane tension is being sustained um, high. Up here, you can see um, you can see down below that the membrane tension is, is elevated. And then in the red, the channels are open. And in the blue, they're closed. And so they're closing despite the fact that the membrane tension is still high. And this is happening in E. coli. Um, Ms. Guess, um, piezo, and then also possibly in uh, MSL10, which is a direct relative to MSL8. Uh, so there's, you know, there's differences, you know, desensitization, inactivation, um, but what's really important for our model is that there's no osmolite conducting uh, when they desensitize or when they inactivate. Um, and so we wanted to kind of incorporate this idea that the osmolite, uh, the osmoregulation goes away possibly after either a period of time or when the membrane tension uh, starts to just decrease. Um, so to incorporate these two possible um, possibilities into the model, um, the first one was closing after a period of time. We established a closing rate. So that's this K close value, um, which you basically use to calculate a change in the ion leakage rate. So as long as the channel is open, then this basically timer starts um, and the K leak value starts to decrease. Um, as, as, the, the, as the time goes on um, before eventually there is no osmotic uh, regulation, no osmolites being released. Um, the second fix um, is the uh, channels closed when the uh, membrane tension starts to decrease. So this is a really simple, just a if then statement in the code. So basically if the uh, D sigma over DT, the change in the membrane tension is less than zero, um, then the K leak becomes zero. This was just really easy to, to implement. So what did these two um, different modifications uh, give us in the simulations? Uh, on the left here is the time inactivation, and then on the right is the uh, decreasing tension inactivation model. Um, so most important to look at is the, the solid lines here. So this is the MSL8 simulation, uh, still lines up well. And then in the wild type um, is much most important. We still see kind of an overshoot in the, the time inactivation. While the decreasing tension and activation, the wild type uh, stabilizes pretty well, just like what we see in the uh, experimental, as you can see in the, the, the light gray line there. So both improve the fit, but it does seem like this, this um, model on the right, the decreasing tension and activation, not only is simpler, but it does actually give a, a slightly better fit. Um, so one thing that we got to thinking about after uh, developing this and thinking this is getting kind of a little bit complicated, um, what if there actually just is no channel function? You know, we don't see an overshoot um, present in uh, this system like there is in, in other systems. Um, so it's possible that maybe the MS channels just really aren't doing anything um, related to osmotic regulation. And it wouldn't be totally unreasonable because other MSL channels like MSL10 does have a non-traditional uh, signaling function. Um, and so I thought it might just be worth exploring this possibility um, although our, this is the opposite of our original hypothesis, um, that maybe MSL8 really isn't contributing to the osmotic regulation. Uh, and so one idea of a way to explain the difference between the wild type and the MSL8 mutant without osmotic regulation is just a difference in the cell wall. Um, so the idea here is that the presence of the MSL8 channels in the wild type are reinforcing the cell wall and strengthening it and allowing it to resist expansion. Uh, while in the MSL8 mutant, because there is no channels, the cell wall is, is more thin and, and, and less reinforced. Um, so this is pretty simple to incorporate in the model. It really simplifies it, actually. Um, basically, just remove all the channel function uh, and allow the uh, MSL8 simulation to undergo that plastic cell wall deformation uh, that I discussed earlier, while the wild type um, doesn't do that. And so what do we see when we 
um, run this kind of model. Um, it, it, so I disclaimer here, because the model here assumes that no osmolites are released, we had to fit the C0 value, the initial osmotic concentration value, um, to the wild type rather than the MSL8, which is what we we're doing in all those other models. So that's why the, the fit here is a little, um, uh, not, as, not as good as the others. Um, but we do see that the wild type simulation does have this very you know, stable um, size, just like what we see in the experimental. Uh, and we do see that expansion in the MSL8 simulation that MSL8 membrane tension gets really high. Um, but I guess that's not entirely unreasonable since they do explode a lot. Um, so it does seem like this could possibly, um, although it doesn't look quite as pretty as like the an activation because the tension decreasing model, um, it could still be a possibility. Um, so we decided to do a test of the models. I actually did a few tests, but I, I don't think I have time to go into all of them uh, today. So I'm just going to discuss this one. Um, so this test was to experimentally increase channel function. So I'm looking at the overexpression of MSLA channels uh, in, in the pollen grains. So doing that same assay, but these pollen have a lot of MSLA channels uh, in them. Um, and so here you can see the MSLA uh, mutant, and then this is a wild type. And all of the overexpression lines look exactly like wild type. They have a very flat stabilization uh, in the volume, which really, to be honest, wasn't what I was expecting. Um, so now the question is, can the models uh, uh, simulate this, the result that we see in the experimental? Maybe this will help us help guide which model is, is the best. Um, so up here in the left, you can see the experimental data, um, which we're comparing everything to. And then we have the time inactivation, uh, decreasing tension inactivation, and then the cell wall strengthening model. So this one has no channel function. And so to uh, simulate this experiment that I did in with increasing channel function, I just increased the ion leakage rate, the K leak. Um, so 0% would be an MSL8 mutant. 100% would be the wild type that has all of its channel function, and then we can increase from there. So 200, 500, or 1,000%. Um, and you see the time inactivation um, still has an overshoot. In fact, it gets more of an overshoot as time goes on. Uh, and then in the tension inactivation, it stabilizes pretty well. And then in the cell wall strengthening, um, since there is no channel function, there's no K-leak value to, to modify. Uh, and you can see it, it stabilizes really well. So, um, just based on this um, uh, test, it seems like the tension inactivation and the cell wall strengthening model are still two pretty strong contenders. Um, so just to conclude, uh, the process of pollen hydration is definitely more complicated than we initially thought, and it seemed like no model was absolutely perfect. There was no clear standout, um, and it definitely highlights the need to kind of readdress our original assumptions about the system. There's definitely complexities. You know, it's desiccated and it has that really unique cell wall structure. There's lots of different ways we could approach um, testing this. Um, and then the uh, MSL8 hydration phenotype it seems like it's probably not due only to channel function. There definitely seems to be some kind of component of the cell wall, either high pressure affecting the cell wall. Um, and then there's the possibility that there really maybe is no osmotic regulation occurring or it's, it's uh, contributing to the, the phenotype in a different way. Um, and so we're very open to suggestions or, or any ideas um, as far as this goes. Um, and we just want to thank the, the whole lab as well as funding sources, and especially Anders. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie and Elizabeth. We're going to keep both of you spotlighted and actually spotlight our speakers as our, our experts right now as well, so they can do a little Q&A with you. Should we start with the questions that were asked on the on the website? Sure, Carlos, however you'd like to. <laughs> okay, I guess, uh, should I read them out? I guess I'll read them out. Um, okay, I'll start with mine because mine is the most important, obviously. <laughs> so um, uh, I think I missed it, but why did you choose this kind of model? And uh, what was this, the question that we're hoping that the model would answer? And uh, or was maybe this just a good way to explain your observed data? I'm curious about why you chose this model. And I, I don't think if you if you address that, I missed it, but I'm curious why why this specific model. Um, you want you want to take this list? 
Um, I mean, this was the only model that we thought of. I think we just, <laughs> it wasn't like we were picking from eight. It was a kinetic model to describe the change in shape over time, which was the question we wanted to ask. I mean, the main question really is, uh, that was driving us is, are we thinking about how mechanosensitive channels contribute to pollen hydration correct? And I think the outcome is no. It, we are not right. And that is a totally cool answer. But yeah, that was what was driving us. And, okay. and yeah, we didn't really like think of different models. It was, I was at this boot, this um, uh, modeling boot camp with Wallace and a bunch of modelers and with Wanda and Nick Ayn, And that was what they were like, here's how we're going to do it. And I was like, okay, sounds great. <laughs> and in the mm -hmm. end, it's, it's ended up being pretty useful, I think. Can I follow up on that? Or can I ju just jump in for a second? I think you did think of different models. The cell wall um, is a completely set different from the channel activity. Those are two very different. Oh, OK. I thought you meant we're approaching it from a completely different type of modeling approach. Like, is that what you were asking, Carlos? Like, oh, that's more like, like OK, so you kind of chose a kind of a very kind of coarse grain description of the of the shining channel, the response. Do you want more fine grain, more coarse grain? Is this answering the questions? Are your questions mechanistic or you just want to kind of get a kind of general behavior? That's what I was curious about. And uh right. and uh, you know why why this model and because there's so many decisions to be made and mm. and um, and I think Belinda was gonna say something. So go ahead. Well I noticed that you started off by saying you were interested in how shape changes with time and then shape is the thing that you kind of simplified right off the bat and mm -hmm. said the same it's spherical. Mm -hmm. um, so between you know you did a bunch of really interesting things to question the validity of some of the simplifications mm -hmm. and the equations themselves but did you go back to that original assumption at all and consider whether the asymmetry of the cell is actually important and whether in fact the cell membrane sorry, the cell wall material properties are uniform and whether the distribution of the ion channels in the cell membrane are uniform, given that the cell does not have a spherical shape, is there mm -hmm. functional importance to that? Yeah, that's a good point, especially that there are, there isn't necessarily uniformity in the pollen grain cell wall. So that's actually a really good point. Um, it has aperture areas that are, that are softer. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that I'll just quickly jump in here. One thing that struck me is when you look at the pictures of the pollen grains, they look like those, you know, those balloons you get when you're a kid, but they're like the ones that have creases in them. And then when you blow them up, right? So they're not, they're not like a uniform structure. And those balloons, if you deflate them, it's not that those folds happen anywhere. It's not like isotropic. There's actually regions of the balloon that are, that are thinner. And those are the parts that collapse more than the thicker ones. And it just strikes me that that, that may be like the, there may be patterning in the cell wall that actually is important. I think, you know, maybe, I don't know. That's what they look like to me, you know, mm -hmm. like those, those, you know, those things you get when, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever played with those, but. I don't know what balloons you're talking about, but it's definitely true that the um, there's an outer cell wall to pollen grains that have what are called apertures, and they're essentially mm, th there are there are regions that are more and that are less resistant to expansion. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's possible that we need to go back and add that type of character to the model. I don't think we know how to do that though um, so at all. I, I promise, so I promise, oh, hold on. I promise this is an affiliate link, but here we go. You can buy these things on Amazon. Oh. Just to show you what it, it reminded me of. This is what they kind of look like, sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is actually, there is a lot of really beautiful modeling that's been done on the desiccation process and how they fold in. Um, Carrie, what's the name of the researcher at Penn who has been working on that? I've forgotten her name. Uh, Elena? Katafori. Elena? Yeah, Katafori has been studying how the there's sort of the, the desiccated structure is made. Um, the assumption has always been sort of in the field that they don't, they are not really providing any 
constraints to rehydration that that's that the that that structure is really designed for efficient folding during desiccation but i think it we'll have to think i think the main question is like how at all we would incorporate any of that geometry into the model that we've developed so far which is completely isometric right yeah right right, right. and there's and there's different ways to do that right there's there, so uh so for example um i so i don't know much about pollen but uh i've seen models about you know different structures similar to this and polymer physics and people that do polymer physics and that do things like um like peg vesicles and things like that worry a lot about is it is it spherical is it uh is it oval like and it turns out that the different uh properties of the membrane actually largely dictate a lot of these things and so what 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 it struck me about your 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 model or your your data was that you know things like do the locations of the mechanosensitive channels matter and uh, does the release of the mechanosensitive channel have any correlation with you know what's going on inside the pollen the pollen bead, right? And so I think that this model is a really good first try at you know kind of capturing the general behavior. If, if you put more pressure, do, does something happen? If you put less pressure, does something happen? But I think that going more towards a, towards a more uh, mechanistic understanding of the process might require a more complicated model or more detailed model to to capture this this nuances. And that's at least how I see it. Which also means you know more computer time. <laughs> yeah, but so how would one go about doing that? Like, what's the? I, I think that the part of the problem for us is we have no idea what that next step would involve. So my next, so the question would would first be how much detail do you want? So do you care about the lipids? Do you care about the membrane? Do you care about individual mechanosensitive channels? Do you know how they're distributed on the surface? Um, we do know how they're distributed and it's pretty evenly. We don't have any evidence that they're localized. I think one major complication is that in the desiccated pollen, there really is no plasma membrane, right? So during rehydration, that plasma membrane is actually reforming <laughs> that is so from cool. like tiny desiccated vesicle type scenarios. Um, that's a really interesting process about which we know very little. Carrie, please please jump in and interrupt me when I start saying stuff I don't, that is wrong. Um, That's the role of graduate students, Carrie. Yes, <laughs> she's, FBI. as I'm sure you can all tell, she knows way more about all of this than I do. Um, so, yeah, so, but, but uh, we have no, you know, the imaging that we have done, at least after hydration, is suggests that there's no special, They're, they seem to be evenly distributed. I mean, mm -hmm. our questions are, we really want to know what the channels are doing and what their function is. And then, I mean, if we could just answer the question, are they behaving as osmotic safety valves or are they doing something else where the ion flux is actually affecting cell wall function, which actually we have a whole other series of experimental data in the lab that suggests may be the case, that would be interesting. So we actually think that the ions going through MSL8 might be affecting components of the cell wall and the ways in which they are interacting with each other in a way that is not about osmoregulation but is about ion uh, about cell wall polymer function that is the kind of thing we would like to ask mm -hmm. right carrie like i think broad mm -hmm. questions are more what we're interested in yeah yeah i agree okay so I'll, I'll i'll jump ahead, in and say have idea. i can tell yeah can i i'll just say like if you want to do something with the shape thing that that I think Belinda pointed out, I think is a really good idea. And also maybe the anisotropy in the like the the fact that it's it's like there's these regions that may be different or something. If you know anything about that, um, there are finite element models that you can yeah. use, uh, but they're really really expensive computationally. So yes. one thing you might be able to do, which is something we do, you know, people do in like polymer physics sometimes is there's um, like a hierarchical group of models. So you might learn something from a more expensive calculation that you can't really run for the whole dynamics, but you can learn something about how to coarse grain or develop like a mean field perspective, right? So if you have a very detailed model and you can only run it for like a short period of time, you might still learn, okay, like what, what function might approximate how the volume relates to the pressure or whatever whatever thing you want to calculate. And then you can say, okay, well, we'll just plug that function into the ODE model. And, you know, that might give us something to say, okay. Um, one thing I was really struck with 
is that was awesome was that like everybody just assumes it's like a hook's law spring or whatever like for anything that's a physical thing it's just a spring but nothing is actually just a hook's law springs don't actually exist really um <laughs> you know it only, it's only an approximation in a very short range of motion and yeah. then it breaks down for any physical material and that was awesome to see that you had to put that into the model i don't know <laughs> I mean, I just felt really good about that because it's like, yeah, we always just say stuff's a spring, but then it's not anyway. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's helpful for me to point out, but I really like that. Yeah. Well, we know Siobhan Braybrook, so we know all about the limits of Hooke's Law. <laughs> so, Siobhan's amazing. Question, Liz, Gary. Yeah. So I, I was immediately struck when you were showing the images of the pollen grains that they're, they obviously polarize their growth extensively. But your simulations cut off. So this is getting back to Belinda's question and followed up by Eric and the balloon analogy. Um, your simulations, I think, are 150 seconds or so. That's before the polarized growth. Yeah. So the polarized yes. growth could be a way of distinguishing your two, your big questions, channel or um, structure. Because if, for example, if it's a cell wall reinforcement, then maybe where the growth polarizes is where the channels are less dense, for example. But on the other hand, if it's functioning exclusively as a channel, then isotropic distribution should be fine. Is that making sense at all? Um, I think so. I mean, I think we have avoided polarized growth because there's so much complexity there that we're not ready to uh, tackle until we have more of a sense of what's happening in the isotropic situation. But what I'm hearing you say is like, well, why not ask those questions because they might help you answer the isotropic question. We do know that the channels are not, they are uniformly distributed until the pollen tube starts to form and then the channels localize there. That's not surprising because everything localizes there because that's where all the growth is happening. So all the membranes, all the proteins, all the materials are being shuttled to the, the tube where all of this, you know, it's like the fastest growing cell in all of the all of plant biology, right? So we don't know, I mean, the localization of the channel is hard to interpret and may not be that informative, but I appreciate your, your idea that maybe putting off looking at the more complex system may not be the most helpful way to go about it. So I think that um, one thing that we haven't mentioned, so we talked about the models, we've talked about the data, but one thing that we, that we as modelers or in general in our field, we don't think a lot about is often the relationship between the model and the data. And one thing that I would love to see with this model is how informative is your data to the model that you think you have in mind that's important, that, that is explaining what you're doing. So what we do in my lab is we actually um, um, use Bayesian statistics, conditional probability, to say what is the probability that this model is explaining this data. And what you can do with that is you can then start to do uh, simulations and say, I have 10 hypotheses that could explain this, this, this behavior. One is the, the open closed valve question, one is the, um, the the uh, the the cell wall pressure question, and you can incorporate all these different hypotheses and then compare them and find whether, uh, first of all, whether one of them actually explains the data better, or two, if there's many competing ones, where should you pick the the next? Where should you do the next experiment mm -hmm. to tell the difference between one and the other? And that's what I would do if I had infinite funding and infinite computer time. Uh huh. That's a cool idea. Because then then you're so because I think that we we fall into this into this trap of the model. And the pro, the, the, and that, 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 that paradigm of the model works really well if you have a train that's traveling from Nashville to Chicago to visit David, and, uh, and we know the speed and we know the direction and we can estimate the time that it's gonna take because we can take that number and plug it straight into our model, right? Because rate times times equal distance, right? But what you're asking here is a little bit different. You're saying, we have all this data from microscopy and we have all this data from, from osmotic pressure experiments and all this stuff, and we want a mechanism. And so what you're doing now is you're inferring the mechanism from data that's not directly related, and you want to understand that relationship first. And I think that that's a crucial part of going from data to knowledge that I think that that is not often very uh, tackled directly head on. And I think that that would actually really help you guys because you would be able to say, okay, is it a value or no? Is it this, is or no? 
and you would be able to narrow down the, the, the thing. So, so, so you're saying she should she could take her her four models, the basic model, the time inactivation, the membrane, I forgot what the other one was called, and then the no channel, no Oswald regulation model, and like compare them to each other in terms of how well they fit the dot. That would be really cool. It, yeah. It's called conditional probability. And so mm -hmm. uh, and Eric knows more about this than me because he actually, he's much smarter than I am. It's um, called what think, probability? Uh, it's called Bayesian statistics or conditional probability. Conditional what probability. you're asking is, 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 is what's the probability of the model you are, want to think about given the data you've observed? Exactly. Yeah. And so it's probably what's called the model evidence. And so you and compare the evidences across all the models. And this is where you get a friend like, like Belinda or Eric or myself, and we run this on lots of GPUs and it takes like a month, but then we say, okay, this is the, this is, this is the model that most explains your data. Yeah, and one thing, um, I'm, uh, yeah, one thing that I'll just say really quickly is that it may actually in the end be that multiple things can explain the data equally well, right. or even if something has a lower, prob so I think that the, the real, the real uh, uh, point here is that your goal is probably hypothesis generation, right? Or, or like, what's the next experiment? Uh, maybe. I mean, I could imagine that all of these scenarios, if tweaked appropriately, could actually give you the shape you're looking for, or the ultimate goal in our field, which is that the line goes through the points. So the line will go through the points, right? And you'd be like, oh, the line went through the points. I, I mean, drop the mic and walk out. But you might have multiple versions of reality that can do that. Um, and so the question then becomes like, okay, what, what can I learn from the model that tells me what's the experiment that's gonna do? I mean, I, this has already been said, but I think in the context of what Carlos was saying, that could be really cool. Cause then, then you know, the model might, might directly suggest, oh, well, it's not the overexpression experiment, but rather like one of the suggestions on the website was cell wall mutants. Are there any of those that might change its mechanical properties? Or you know maybe it's really about looking at whether or not um, the 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 like I like doing some measurements of the cell wall properties in different ion conditions and seeing if ion concentrations actually because I could see that it's like very chargey right like there's lots of it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a like a sugary thing so it's got lots mm -hmm. of like alcohol groups and it it might the ions might change how it like different if you put that the just the pollen husk in different ionic strengths, it might break differently or something. So, you know, those things might be, might be like, 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 like suggested by the model or something. And that, that would be awesome. Anyway, I'm going to stop. Hey, you have time for about one more quick question. Belinda, you've been quiet. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, she said quick question. <laughs> Um, well, I love the way this discussion has just gone to thinking about a more probabilistic formulation and thinking about using the model to figure out what to measure next. So I had kind of an experimental question because I am actually very interested in, ooh, what can you do experimentally? You've got these site-directed mutagenesis type experiments where you've been able to dial down the function of these channels, and then you have an overexpression um, example as well. Have you at all been able to identify a site-directed mutagenesis experiment where you can basically dial up the activity of the channels and use that as a variable that might help you begin to understand the role of their function? Um, not yet, but it's in the works. It's in the greenhouse. <laughs> okay, turned out to be a quick one. Yeah. yeah. It, I did do the hydration with the, the point mutant that, that's blocked, so it doesn't have the channel function. Uh, and it looks just like uh, the pollen without MSL8. So that is another question. I, I didn't have time to add in, but um, that's another thing that we think about. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the presenters and thank you to the uh, experts. If we could all share some emojis and give them a round of applause. What a very rich discussion. Thank you all so much. Um, so what we would like to uh, tell you is that we will leave commenting on uh, the project presentation page. So if there are still questions on there, we will invite the presenters to uh, still go through those questions and answer those for our participants so that they're not left wondering. Um, so as we begin to wrap up this segment, 
we'd like to uh, tell you that we are getting ready for our lunch break for those that are lunching at this time. And we will reconvene in this space at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So that's at the top of the hour for whoever is not in Eastern time. And this room will close and reopen five minutes prior to the restart. Uh, just a reminder that there are still just very few spots left for the concurrent um, sessions. So please go on there and sign up during the break uh, if you can. And uh, we'll have about 40 minutes. So we will uh, come back after break and reconvene in this space and get ready for our next activity. Uh, the KI team will remain here uh, for a couple of minutes in case there are any questions. And once again, we would love to thank our project presenters and our 